Oh, of course. No, it's ignoring me. All right, so, of course, the first slide's completely wrong. Well, that's okay. Okay, Linux file systems, yay. This is probably the most technical set of slides for the whole term. Um, other than we're talking about bash scripting, which is programming-ish. Um, so file systems, you guys should roughly know what a file system is by now if you took computer essentials. A file system is a collection of directory and files. Yay. That's basically what Windows is and what Mac. Hey, Mac guy's not there. I can't make fun of him. Um, I guess I broke him. <laughs> Mac guy, I apologize if you're watching this later. <laughs> but anyways, all operating systems have a file system of some sort with the exception of a few strange ones. Um, the rarities of the ones that don't have a file system would be AS400, for example. It doesn't really have a file system. It also doesn't really have a database. The answer is yes to both and no to both. It, it's strange. Like, you actually move files by running queries in a specialized IBM language. It looks like nothing you've ever used. It's strange. Um, so it's a collection of, file of files and folders. And most Unix file systems or operating systems have more than one file system connected to it at a time. They don't have to exist all on one disk. They can exist on multiple disks. Or you can turn around and have a single disk with all your file systems, or you could have it spread across multiple disks or a combination thereof. Each, um, each file on a Linux file system is contained in a structure, well, I can't say contained, but information about it's contained in something called an inode. It has a unique number. So each inode has a unique number. That means each file basically has a unique number. And each file system big, big starts with a big, huge pile of empty inodes. Um, this is very different from other operating systems, such as Windows or Mac. But Mac's kind of weird because it's partly Unix also, so it, it's a bit of both. Uh, but the Windows file system, the NTFS file system, the old FAT file system don't have a limit. On the other hand, when you create a file system for Linux, it's depending on the size of the partition, it allocates a set number of inodes assuming this is the maximum number of files you're ever going to put on it. It is entirely possible to run out of inodes. It's rare, but it happens. When the files are deleted, it removes the inode, marks the inode as empty. So if anybody here knows how the old DOS file systems used to work where you deleted a file and all it did is it emptied out the entry in the FAT table, and even though the file was still there, its location was magically available. Linux does the same thing except it's got an inode table with a number and it says, this number is empty now. Um, if there are no inodes, the file system can't create a new file. You just ran out of room. You could have a five terabyte drive and then you got a gajillion 1K files, so maybe you're occupying four gigs of tiny little files. You're now out of room. It's one of the strange limitations of the Linux file system. It's really disgusting. It doesn't happen very often, but it's a possibility. Yes, but you've got to do it at format time. So you can't, though there are tools to manually manipulate this, but usually you, end up, you may end up overwriting files because it needs to have room to write those inodes. So you got, you know, inodes up here, then you got some files down here, then you need more inodes, guess where they're going? So all this has got to be moved out of the way. And historically, you don't want to do that. You just want to make sure that, you know, but what are the odds you're going to have a disk full of gajillion little files, 1K files, 5K, half K files? The odds are pretty small. So inodes are contained in a special file called the inode list. Inode numbers are specific to a single file system. So every file system you have on a Linux server or Linux machine has its own set of inode numbers. 
And if you want to know what the inode number is for a given file, or the given files, you can do an ls-i. It'll give you a list of the inodes that are applicable to the files in that current directory. So you know how you have your ls-al, which is all long format? You can throw on an i while you're at it, and it'll give you the inode number for each of the files. So you actually know what its magic number is. Sometimes you get corrupted inodes, and it's good to know what the inode number is. So you can go clean up the mess. Uh, if you're at that level playing inside of a Linux system, you probably have other problems as it is. But it's entirely possible that, you know, the odd time it'll break. Now, those are inodes. Essentially, you can picture an inode as your driver's license number or your SIN number. Actually, your driver's license number or your health card is actually a good example. Um, because your driver's license number actually on the back, you know, that nice little code that's the barcode across the back contains all kinds of cool information about you. How big you, how it's, uh, what's your height, eye color, that kind of stuff. Do you need glasses? Do you need special equipment? Do you have any restrictions? It's all on your card and it's identified by your driver's license number. iNodes do the same thing. How, how big is the file? What's, what is its physical address on the file system, like on the disk itself? Uh, what file system is it in? That kind of stuff. So that's what the iNodes give you. Now, a file system is the logical means for an OS to store and retrieve data on available storage mediums. Okay, that's a nice bunch of non-descriptive words. In other words, a file system is the logical layer between you and the raw information on the disk. This is something you should know about computer, computer essentials. Yeah. <sighs> what the heck did I say? A logical file, the log basically a file system is the logical layer that allows a human to interact with the raw data on the disk. So the ones and zeros that are on the, on the spinning disk are the ones and zeros contained in some chip of memory, like in a flash drive. You can't manipulate them, but a file system allows you to touch them. And the file system allows you to create and move, delete files, directories, modify them, opening them for reading and writing, searching, seeking, that kind of stuff. These are all things you can do with files on a file system. And as you can see, you see a little list of commands listed next to each of the tasks. They're specific to Linux. Now, those basic functions are common to all operating systems. Obviously, what would be the point of an operating system if you can't move files? If you can't delete files, if you can't create new files, there's no point. Um, however, each operating system handles them differently, of course. And depending on how they implement it, there's some big perks and some really bad things. Um, in Linux, the file concept is easy. It's just a sequence of bytes. The bytes are written out to a disk. There it is. So everything inside of a Unix slash Linux operating system is treated as a file. It's kind of cool. Whether it's a CD-ROM or a USB port, a network interface, everything is a file. They're just a series of bytes. The system knows what to do with them magically. Um, so in other words, all input-output devices are treated as files. That means you can read from a serial port. You can write a file out also to a serial port. And for those of you that don't know what that means, that means that it'd be like the old style printers where you could actually go cat space file pipe slash dev slash, oh, what the heck was the one for the serial port? Anyways, some device, magic device block number and shit would come out on your printer. It was magic. It's been so long since I've done it, I couldn't remember what the heck it was. I was going to go with S01, but no, that's usually a SCSI device one. Um, but these have magic numbers. So that means everything is treated as a file. Even a directory is treated as a file. Why? Because it has an inode, and it has a set of parameters that identifies what kind of device, a file it is, and the operating system knows what to do with it. Um, Linux and Unix differ from other operating systems, obviously. As you're playing around, things are a little different in there. Um, there's a lot of common ground between Linux and other file systems also, by the same token, just because they're different doesn't mean 
they have, they're totally incompatible with each other concept-wise. Uh, Tool-wise, they're mostly incompatible with each other because they're not the same file system. It'd be like saying, hey, I'm going to take the engine from a BMW and throw it in a Lada, and it's going to work. And yeah, the Lada will rip itself to pieces in seconds. You know, or I'm going to take this motorcycle engine and throw it in the, in the body of a semi. And yeah, theoretically, the wheels might turn. And it's not going to do much, but it might work. Now, one of the commonalities is from monitoring systems is a hierarchical tree structure. Now, windows you're used to C, right? C colon backslash. That's the root of your file system. In Linux, forward slash. That's known as the root file system. The, essentially everything else exists below it. It has, the root system has its own partition. Now you guys know what partitions are, yes? Vaguely, do you remember this from Computer Essentials? Maybe? Vaguely? Okay. Oh, just so don't leave me hanging. Just having blue shirt nodding yes isn't enough for me. <laughs> okay, nod louder. Yeah. <laughs> one sound, one hand clapping. Um, however, <laughs> Jesus. However, um, what's different about Linux as opposed to and Unix, I got so anything that ends in X, essentially. What's different about this file system as opposed to Windows or even old Macs, not the new Macs, I'm talking about old Macs, or OS2, or pick any other operating system that's actually, you know, modern, um, is that all partitions that get mounted are mounted underneath the slash. So instead of having C drive, D drive, E drive, F drive, you know, to Z, then you run out of drive letters. On a Unix file system, you have a directory and you mount the partition to that directory, which means that instead of going, oh, I need to modify things on my backup drive, so I'm gonna go D colon enter, CD go into here and delete stuff, or as opposed to click, 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 click. On a Unix file system, you go CD slash, you know, var, and whoop, away you go. You're into the file system. In other words, you can have as many files and directories as you want under root. There's no actual limit other than obviously running out of inodes. You can organize, organize it any way you want. You can have um, subdirectories that are actually other partitions. Um, for example, a common way of breaking things down um, and I'm not sure if they've got it listed. I think it's later in this. Um, you can, uh, an, off, an often method of doing this is they'll take the home directory and put it on a separate disk on large Unix systems where people actually log into the Unix system. Why? Because home directories would tend to build up a lot, use a lot of space and they need it. However, they might not need to be accessed quite as fast as the rest because they're just reading like a Word document or text document or whatever. So they'd move them to a different array of disks so they can have arrays of the home directories and then the main operating system elsewhere. Um, a little bit later, actually, I talk about what are the common partitions that you'll find. There are some very important directories that you find in every Linux operating system. The first one is slash, root. It's where everything begins. It's the root of all good things. It's also the root of all bad things. Slash root. By now you guys should know what slash root is. What is slash root? Other than what it obviously says on the screen, it's the root user's home directory. As opposed to being slash home slash something, root directory is always slash root. Bin. Slash bin is where most commands reside. Else. CD. Unlike DOS, for those of you that have played in DOS, where CD, DIR, and all that's actually part of the DOS kernel, as in there aren't programs separate for these things, they're actually part of the core operating system. In Linux, every command actually has a file, an actual little binary that matches. LS has a binary. It's possible to accidentally nuke your LS if you wanted to. 
Um, as bin, usually those are the administrative tools. Secure, secure bin. More, a lot of users don't have access to this directory, as in they can't run the commands in there. What do you find in there? Things like fdisk, uh, mkfs, user add, that kind of stuff, where the commands are for administrative use, therefore they shouldn't exist anywhere else. Slash boot. That's where the files are that allows your Linux system to actually turn itself on. Slash dev. That's a special directory. Everything under there is a file, big quote marks in the air here, is a file that points to a device of some sort on your computer. If you go and load up your Linux install and you go under CD dev and then you go ls, you'll see a, all kinds of entries in there. Uh, CD-ROM and then or you know, a bunch of things that starts with S for serial ports and or uh, SCSI adapters. Um, IDE ones were different numbers. Uh, SD would be another one, which would be serial disk. SD0. Oh, TTYS. Yes. Which brings us back to the whole if teletype, or you know, you can see the number. For, for if you are deaf, dial this number for the TTY, and it does the automatic braille. It's really cool. You should see this machine. Other important directories, slash etc. This is where all your settings are for the operating system. If you need to change a setting, it's somewhere under etc. Unless it's specific to your user. Should you play in etc? No. Not unless you actually know what you're doing. Um, it's very easy to break things semi-permanently in there. Uh, var. So these are administrative files, uh, log files, swaps, swap files, uh, various and sundry other things. Uh, if you have a web server, odds are it's sitting under var, var triple w. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff in there. If you're running a Postgres server on Linux, it's actually going to be under var lib pgsql, and that's where it's going to store its, its data. Why is it there? I have no idea, but that's what they decided upon years ago, and we're still using it. It's home. Okay, we, we all know what home is. Lib. Those are the libraries. Now, you guys know about DLLs and Windows. Hopefully you know what DLLs are. They're library files. And Windows is notorious for its DLL hell, where you have the files with the same name but different versions and bad things start happening. Windows 10 has fixed most of those problems. Windows 8 actually fixed most of those problems, I should say. Um, Linux has libraries, and it's actually can be almost as bad. Um, and it's all contained under lib. So if you've got programs that need special libraries like Encrypt or uh, SHA1, any of those kinds of secure libraries, um, they'd be found in there. Proc. If there are running processes, and trust me, there's always running processes on a Linux system, it's where the interface is for each of them. Each process in there usually has a process number or a process name. And you can actually send information from one program to another program by routing it through the proc directory. So if you pulled up your VMware install and you looked under proc, you'd see a bunch of files. Each of those files belongs to some service running in the background. And if you know what you're doing, don't start pushing stuff in there randomly. Watch people, hey, that's cool, I gotta go look. Don't start pushing stuff 